Uh, we understand that it's convention for prize winners to show a survey of recent work, and to a certain extent, we'll do that. Our primary goal for the next 30 minutes, though, is to sketch the contours of a theory and to use our recent work to illustrate that theory. Be warned that the theory is nascent and somewhat crude, and we're not entirely convinced of its worth. Uh, <laughs> but this venue, among some of the people we admire most in the discipline, seems like the ideal place to float a trial balloon and see where it lands. In this case, we're floating an actual trial balloon. On the possibility of a new balloon animal is a speculation on the way balloon animals work, what it might mean to make a new one, and most importantly, what a balloon animal architecture might look like. While balloon animals might seem indelibly associated with pop art and children's birthday parties, we think a close reading yields a set of generalizable principles that escape these associations and generate a range of effects that are closer to the reach of classical music than the flatness of pop. We're also trying out a, <clears throat> pardon me, we're also trying out a new format tonight. We don't often lecture together. And when we do, we have to consider how to share a microphone and use two voices to serve the intellectual content of what we're saying. So tonight, Andrew is going to walk through four points on the possibility of a new balloon animal. And I'm going to intercede with, with whichever precedents from art history and architecture happen to be on our minds and in our conversations at the moment. Here's the first one. Jeff Koontz. Rabbit, 1986. It's our exemplar balloon animal, maybe one of the best balloon animals ever made. Uh, <clears throat> we hope you like it because you're going to be seeing this image at least four more times during the lecture. Uh, so the first point on the possibility of a new balloon animal, hollowness. In Michael Fried's uh, 1969 essay, Art and Objecthood, he describes a strain of minimalist art as creating the impression of hollowness. Works like this one, Tony Smith's 1968 cube called Die, appeared to Freed and his fellow critics as taut, thin surfaces concealing an interior void instead of a solid chunk of material. Not explicitly stated in the essay, but strongly implied, is the question, what's in there? This question, what's in there, was linked to a dramatic theatrical effect. It was, at the time, a damning critique of minimalist work. What's in there allowed the viewer to imagine all kinds of interior concealed things and launch the artwork into territory more aligned with the titillation of burlesque or drag than with the ambitions proper to high art. What the hell was in there anyway? Balloon animals give us a way to use Freed's hollowness to different ends. To help define the range of possible outcomes, we can examine other works of art that are explicitly hollow but not yet fully figured as animals. <clears throat> In Bruce Nauman's Lighted Performance Box, 1969, hollowness requires a special kind of cognition, not to employ criticism but to speculate and invent. Here, speculative intervention is turned over to the audience. It's clear from the outside that Lighted Performance Box is hollow, but there's no view to the inside the audience must imagine what might be inside producing the lit projection on the wall. The speculative effect is heightened by a fake light switch, which when properly curated, <clears throat> this piece um, is shown with a gallery guard, usually conveniently absent, tempting viewers to try out the switch, but the electric cord is false. It doesn't control the light inside. It serves no particular function other than to entice the visitor to flip it confound their expectations to produce a desired result, and increase the speculative urge. That didn't work, so what's inside? <clears throat> so the difference between our work and a particular strain of post-minimalism is the degree to which the speculative invention shifts from author to audience. With Nauman, the shift is nearly total. All of the creative invention must occur in a viewing audience. With us, it's about a 50-50 split. We do not allow generic forms and materials to make an appearance very often. Our work is highly authored and highly articulated, and therefore we are able to narrow and uh, direct the trajectory of speculation along a very particular line. In our recent work, we've explored three different kinds of hollowness. So this is exposed hollowness in a project called RK Apothecary, 
It was a bath and body store completed in 2010. It was an interior renovation of a retail space in Frank Gehry's Edgemar complex in Santa Monica. Sadly, it no longer exists. It was dismantled by Chainsaw. Uh, we designed the store so that shoppers would browse piles of merchandise heaped atop large hollow tables. Here, uh, and the tables have big cuts in the side that reveal the interior. Here, hollowness had two effects. The first was to make shopping three-dimensional and encourage new bodily behaviors. People peeked, people crawled, people got inside, and those became acceptable ways of browsing the store. Second, exposed hollowness allowed us to reassign the spatial arrangement of objects in a retail interior. Chandeliers normally hovering above an audience here are relocated <coughs> to the floor. We call this a floor-standing chandelier. The hollowness of the table functions as a pocket that is not subject to the pragmatic pressures of the rest of the retail program and therefore allows whimsical and disobedient speculation. We've also played around with a second kind of hollowness that we call hermetic hollowness. Um, this is a project called Who's Under There, which is part of a larger installation called 48 Characters installed at the University of Michigan in 2013. Um, here, a series of plaster balloon animals are perched atop large pedestals carved from solid blocks of wood. In order to avoid resting the balloon animals uh, on a ground, the pedestals are carved to imply that something might be underneath. At certain corners, there is a ruffle of tromploid drapery. Even though the pedestal is solid and there is nothing but more solid material to see underneath. Uh, accompanying the pedestals were a series of drawings that use formal analysis of each pedestal to demonstrate that the posture, stance, and attitude of every solid block implies the existence of another balloon animal underneath. And finally, uh, drapery and implied hollowness. This is a series of chess pieces called Possible Hidden Courtesans. It was made for a show on chess uh, curated by Jai and Jai Gallery in Los Angeles earlier this year. We chose to use the uh, implied or partial hollowness of drapery because it gave us a way to suggest intrigues unfolding between the court of chess pieces without actually having to construct a series of static situations. So here's the queen. It's clear she's up to something or maybe any number of things. The king, uh, the snickering knight, the rook. Drapery is a special case of hollowness, and this detail is of interest to us, uh, because its edges reveal the device that does the concealing. At the edge, we see the thickness of the fabric, its hand or the fluidity of its drape, and the tightness of its conformance to the objects underneath. All of these things, in turn, allow us to guess at how much the fabric can hide, to guess at how much error there might be between what we think we see underneath the hidden fabric and what is actually there. Uh, the next point on the possibility of a new balloon animal is subject, 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 or all audience. With Kuhn's rabbit, we are curious to know where the audience is and how the audience behaves. It may seem obvious that the audience is the viewing subject in the room and that the rabbit is the object being viewed, but we think rabbit is a very cagey, very precise constructor of its own audience. The highly polished surface that returns the gaze of the viewer is a hint. We think Rabbit constructs an audience like this. This is not a photograph of an object surrounded by many viewing subjects. <clears throat> Rather, it is a portrait of a subject, another subject, and another subject. There is no object. It is a picture of an audience plus one. There is a new audience member who happens to be enjoying a moment of popular attention. Even though the pinata is an inanimate object, we can subscribe a certain subject to it. Look at its erect posture. Note the steely glint in its eye. It alludes to a degree of vitality. We should not feel an urgency to judge, analyze, or crit critique the pinata. He is more likely a candidate for play and friendship. <clears throat> the the pinata simply states, I am full of candy. My legs are stout. Would you like to take some shade and lean against me? It introduces the possibility of an architecture that is all audience with both, with both animate and inanimate members. We've experimented with several ways to constitute our own inanimate subjects like the pinata. If we find a flaw with the pinata, it's the name pinata. It exists as a known thing before you encounter it, and that quality of knowing the thing in advance, knowing the rules of engagement in advance, blunts the effect of constructing an inanimate subject. Knowing in advance, it becomes possible to attribute the effects of subjecthood to a prescribed ritual instead of meeting a new friend. 
So we tried to create subjects that are not known in advance, where the rules of first encounter are deliberately left open. Uh, so the first project in this vein uh, is called In the Garden Grows a Lump, which was a show of rare books on the picturesque at the University of Michigan this past January, where we used um, aesthetics and bodily effects to try to construct our inanimate subjects. Um, this is also somewhat related to, or very closely related to our uh, work in the gallery next door. So the lumps were designed to be intentionally a little hunched, a little ugly, and what the practitioners of the picturesque would have called a pig-backed hill. There's just enough posture and stance to indicate that the hill forms are intrinsically willful, not entirely natural, and not entirely governed by the angles of repose that would govern the disposition of an actual landscape. The 1,200 square foot gallery was packed, completely full of these hill characters, so that navigating the gallery became an invitation to climb and play or crawl underneath and take a nap. Visitors were required to take off their shoes and walk in stocking feet over the intensively textured surface of the lumps, viewing the books always at a slight angle or while standing on an incline. Um, Again, returning to the installation 48 characters, um, we've attempted to create inanimate subjects by creating characters that mimic human agency. So the plaster balloon animals from 48 characters were designed um, to solicit touch from the audience, uh, but also to touch back and to touch each other or snuggle. Sometimes touching each other in the same way that they solicit the human hand, here a fat belly being poked, the effect was to distribute interaction across the entire audience, both animate and inanimate. So the next point on the possibility of the new balloon animal is line and identity. The silhouette of rabbit establishes its identity as an immediate gestalt flash, rabbit. But the silhouette is an imperfect reduction of the actual lines of the surface of the sculpture. There at the joint between uh, leg and stomach, the line infoliates from the edge of the surface to the middle of the body. Line moves into the fat of the animal, and as it does so, loses some of its capacity to achieve an immediate gestalt differentiation of what's what, of which body parts are which. Although there is clearly a stomach and clearly a leg, somewhere deep in the thigh crevice is a twist in the balloon that entangles stomach and leg and does not permit a perfect distinction between the two. Line, in other words, is not coincident with identity. Line is related to the establishing of the identity of the thing as a rabbit, but it is an imperfect relationship. This is an all too familiar Adam detail. We've seen it before. I hope we've all seen it before. Um, <clears throat> From, Michelangelo, from pardon me, Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel. <clears throat> there is a similar quality to the line here. Line occurs at the edges of the figure to describe its limits, but it also folds to the interior of the figure to describe muscular anatomy, hot bodies. And in the process, line at the periphery of the figure recedes in importance. The importance of iconography decays with this increasing emphasis on the delineation of the interior of the body. There is, in a sense, less atom folds and creases delay attention in the middle, and they do not resolve direct objects with precision. <clears throat> folds and creases are not completely coincident with the body parts they describe. The edge is always partial or incomplete. So three of our projects um, attempt to use this slippage between line and identity. So one more time with feeling, the uh, plaster balloon animals of uh, 48 characters. So we would call this an almost total dislocation between line and identity. Line doesn't necessarily have anything to do with differentiating one part of the balloon animal from another. Instead, it's a free line. We would call it a free writing into the fat of the character. Um, we've also attempted something we call um, the schizophrenic line in a super runner store here in the city, uh, completed late last year. The interior of the store is clad in panels that are covered in a de decorative tracery, um, but the reading of the tracery continually switches between a pattern with no implication of depth and an abstract landscape that the viewer can project themselves into. Uh, we've also attempted a technique that we would call line ad nauseum. This is the interior of 620 South Main in downtown uh, Los Angeles that was a renovation of the common spaces of a condominium building. Um, here, the outline of the figure is very simple and clear. It's just a series of stripes that bend around the wall. 
Um, but they are rendered using tightly spaced parallel lines that make the edges blurry, indistinct to the point where they can establish visual rhymes with objects in three-dimensional space. Um, and as an aside, this is one of the few photographs of our work that has not been photoshopped. Um, from the last point, um, from program containers to container programs. Balloon animals raise the problem of what to do with space and where to put the program. In most of architecture, the building is a container. Space is the thing you fill with program. Perhaps the most perfect example is Mies Crown Hall of 1956. The architecture defines a space within which program is contained. In fact, architecture exists only at the extreme edges of the building to reinforce its function as a program holding container. And after this container has been defined, it is the job of program to fill the space, as in here you go, fill it. For Crown Hall, this has proved to be an almost insurmountable challenge. In balloon animal architecture, there is a different possibility that does not use containers. Instead, program is the thing that gets filled with stuff, or program is the charge that develops between pieces of stuff. <clears throat> one of my favorite works of architecture, one that I return to on a regular basis, is the Asamkirche in Munich between 1733 and 1746. Um, it is overwhelming, it is extreme, and I think it is the best example of the German late Baroque. It's also an example of an anti-crown hall, a container program. We're interested in the Asamkirche as a container program at three scales. At the scale of the city block, it is bookended between two buildings and has no real walls of its own. In a sense, it's not a building, but, but the residual space between two other buildings that has been filled with stuff. <clears throat> at the scale of the interior, there is a relentless layering of object that grow, objects that grows more dense toward the periphery. The wall itself and the transition to the exterior are almost impossible to identify. The windows that appear to be located at the edge of the building cannot be edge, at the edge of the building at all because they would be completely blocked by the wall of a neighboring building. Instead, they are set in from the edge to capture sunlight, and there is yet another wall beyond. It is a Russian nesting doll. At the scale of the wall, there is no wall, only a series of planes at various depths. Ornament swims in and out of these depths. <clears throat> so the Asamkirche is a container program. In fact, it is the program of church that is the sack that is stuffed with things. We adopted this approach uh, for a front runner shoe store in West Hollywood, California, which just opened this spring. Uh, the architecture is just a set of three walls scattered across the retail floor. The walls bend so that no two surfaces in the store are exactly parallel. And it is detailed to reinforce the separate, separateness of each object so that the program of shoe sales becomes the container that allows it to cohere as a single thing. We would also say that our exhibition in the gallery next door is a container program. The title is a survey of its contents from the ground up. <clears throat> two pillows, two lumps, three tables, three books, nine tchotchkes. And in the notes to the exhibition, we call it a living room turned inside out. Nominating the thing as a living room suggests a way to approach it and allows a form of coherence but the edge remains free and open, implicating the extents of the room, conversing with the work of our colleagues, admitting all things with ease. Thank you. <clears throat>